Our Old Testament scripture reading is taken from uh, First Chronicles. No, is it First Chronicles or Second Chronicles? Well, I'm reading Second Chronicles. It lists First Chronicles, but I'm I'm reading Second. Uh, Second Chronicles uh, 26, chapter 26, is about Uzziah, who reigned in Judah. And what we have here is when we read through it, you're going to watch the, proje- proje- the procession of how it is that he goes. His father before him didn't do the ways of the Lord and ended up being a leper, left alone by himself and end- ended up dying. So when he comes through, he, he begins his-, his kingship faithful, looking to the Lord for all things. And he's promised that if he, as long as he continues to look to the Lord, he'll be continually blessed. And then one day, he starts looking around, just like Nebuchadnezzar did, and starts making the mistake of thinking that he, he was something and he no longer needed the Lord. His pride rose up in him. And that's kind of the central theme of our sermon this evening, uh, which I've entitled Against Puffery. It's not against smoking cigars. It's against puffing oneself up or thinking hot, more highly than you ought to. And that this is really this pride that the Corinthians had was really the crux of the situation. It was really what was driving much of what was wrong there. And of course, you know, pride is, some have said it is the worst sin. And it's the beginning of all sin is pride. So let's look at uh, the story of Isaiah, chapter 26, Second Chronicles. Now all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king instead of his father, Amaziah. He built a lap and restored it to Judah after the king rested with his fathers. Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king, and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jecoliah, or Jecolali, um, just, just say Jacob, Jacob, we're going to call her J, of Jerusalem. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father, Amaziah, had done. He sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. Now he went out and made war against the Philistines and broke down the wall of Gath, the wall of Jebna, and the wall of Ashdod. And he built cities around Ashdod and among the Philistines. God helped him against the Philistines, against the Arabians who lived in Gerbaal, and against the uh, Minyanites. Also the Amorites brought tribute to Uzziah. His fame spread as far as the entrance of Egypt, for he became exceedingly strong. And Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate, at the valley gate, and at the quarter buttress of the wall. Then he fortified them. Also, he built towers in the desert. He dug many wells, for he had much livestock, both in the lowlands and in the plains. He also had farmers and vine dressers in the mountains and in Carmel, for he loved the soil. Moreover, Uzziah had an army of fighting men who went out to the war by companies according to the number of their role. As prepared by Jael, the scribe of Messiah, the officer under the hand of Hananiah, one of the king's captains. The total number of the chief officers of the mighty men of valor was 2,600. And under their authority was an army of 300 and uh, 7,500 that made war with the mighty power to help the king against the enemy. Then Uzziah prepared for them the entire army, shields, spears, helmets, body armor, bows, and slings to cast stones. And he made devices in Jerusalem, invented by skillful men, skillful men to be on the towers and the corners, to shoot arrows and large stones. So his fame spread far and wide, for he was marvelous, marvelous, marvelously helped to tell he became strong. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of of incense. So Azariah the priest 
went after him, and with him were eighty priests of the Lord, valiant men. And they withstood King Uzziah and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the son of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed. You shall have no honor from the Lord your God. Then Uzziah became furious, and he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was angry with the priest, leprosy broke out on his forehead before the priest in the house of the Lord, besides the incense altar. And Azariah, the chief priest, and the priest looked at him, and there on his forehead was, he was leprous. So they thrust him out of the, that place. Indeed, he also hurried to get out because the Lord had struck him. King Uzziah was a leper until the day of his death. He dwelt in an isolated house because he was a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. Then Jotham, his son, was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. Now the rest of the acts of Uzziah, from the first to the last, the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, wrote. So Uzziah rested with his fathers, and they buried him with his fathers in the field of burial, which belonged to the kings. For they said, He is a leper. Then Jotham, his son, reigned in his place. Our New Testament reading is found... In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we will be reading from chapter, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, we'll be reading from verses 6 through 13. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sake, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. For who makes you differ from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? You are already full. You are already rich. You have reigned as kings without us. And indeed, I, I could wish you did reign, that we also might reign with you. For I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, last, as men condemned to death. For we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are dishonored. To the present hour, we both hunger and thirst, and we are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless. And we labor, working with our own hands. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we endure. Being defamed, we entreat. We have been made as the filth of the world, the offscoring of all things until now. Let us pray. Father, we do thank you for these words. We thank you for the lesson that is here. I pray for your spirit that you would fill me so that I can preach faithfully that you would be glorified and that we would be edified, instructed, corrected, rebuked if necessary, and that your hand would be in us, O Lord, that we would be fed by Christ, that we would hear Christ, and that we would rejoice that you've given us your word. It's in your son's holy, precious name we pray. Amen. Well, we've already spoken about divisions over and over again uh, as we've gotten through this. And you'll notice that it's chapter 4 of 1 Corinthians, and Paul really hasn't moved off that subject yet. He's still working on confronting them with the divisions that are found in the body of Christ. Now, divisions go against the very nature of God. They strike at the very body of Christ. Divisions are completely contrary to the Godhead and what God is doing in the life of his people. Uh, he, he hates divisions so much that when it comes to a husband and wife, divorce is permitted, but he hates divorce because it is a division. Okay, the, the husband and wife are to be that reflection of the Imago Dei, the full uh, Revelation or the full, seeing the fullness of the Imago Dei in a husband and wife. And when that is cut asunder, God hates it because it goes against his nature. 
God hates divisions in the body of Christ because the body of Christ is to reflect the unity of the Godhead. The three persons of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, are all in perfect unity at all times. And since we are made in the image of God as individuals and those who are married, we are to reflect that unity in the body of Christ as well. Now, some might say, Timothy, or somebody else, didn't Christ come not to bring peace, but to bring a sword resulting in divisions? And so I'd like us to take some time right now and just turn over to Matthew chapter 10. That's where we got our meditation from to look at that, because that does sort of it. And we got to answer that question. We got to ask the question, did he come to bring divisions? If you have the same version of my uh, New King James version that I'm using at the top of verse 34, just before it, it says Christ brings divisions. And we have to ask the question, well, aren't divisions bad? Why did Christ bring that? All right. Back up a little bit to verse 32 and just let's look, start there. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against his mo- her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow me, follow after me, is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he loses it, his life, for my sake, will find it. What Jesus is saying here, and we can assume that he is coming to bring division, but he's cutting out those who belong to him from the fallen race of humanity. He is dividing that which belongs to him and bringing them into the body of Christ, and that, in a sense, separates them from the mass of humanity. So in the context of confessing and denying Christ to men, as we come to know Christ and confess Him publicly, showing that we have unity with Him, that will be bring division for us, not only in our families, but in our workplace and in the world. This is why he says, for I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against his mother, and daughter-in-law against his, her mother-in-law, and man's enemies will be those of his own household. Jesus was saying that when we come to know Christ, our allegiances change. And the reality is that we go from being in a kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And the moment that that happens, those of us, those who we know who we love dearly, technically and in in a real spiritual sense, become our enemies because they are not a part of the kingdom of life. We will find ourselves, as we come to know Christ, at war with people who we should not be at war with, spiritually speaking. I knew a man at DTS who was a professional tennis player and was somewhat successful. He was in the top 50 at one time. So he was making some money and he was married to a Jewish woman who was uh, a practicing Jewish woman because he didn't care. He was an atheist and somebody started sharing the gospel with him. And he came to know the Lord. And he walked home, he walked into his house and he loved his wife and she loved him. And he said to her, honey, I need to tell you today, I've trusted in Christ and he is my savior. I am now a Christian. And she says, I love you. I'm going to divorce you. And they got divorced. It was just that quick. He he realized, he realized what this verse really meant when he walked into that household. He wanted to stay married. He wanted to keep the marriage going. But she divorced him just like that. So that's what happened. That's what Jesus is telling us is going to take place when people come to know the Lord. But once we're in the Lord, that's when the divisions in us need to stop. 
That's when the divisions between us and in the body of Christ need to put, be put aside. That's what was happening in Corinth. Turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Uh, the divisions were completely unacceptable because of the fact that, that they were going against the very thing that Jesus was trying to do, bringing together the body in unity. And at the heart of all of these divisions was pride. It was brought about by those who were seeking to exalt themselves. They were people who thought they were completely self-sufficient. Again, that phrase comes up over and over and over in my readings and studies of this. They thought that they were self-sufficient. What's self-sufficient? You don't need anything. You've got everything you need. That's what happened to Uzziah. He, he built, re- rebuilt everything. He put towers on the, on the forts at Jerusalem so that he could shoot arrows. He was all kinds of things like that. And he got sit, sit there thinking that he was self-sufficient. He no longer needed God. His pride crept in and fooled him. So the people in Corinth were the same way. They were puffed up in their own estimation. And being puffed up is never a place for a Christian. We should operate, should operate from a stance of humility. Now, uh, this is, uh, when I say we we operate from a stance of humility, that doesn't mean we walk around mealy-mouthed, well, you know, amen. Uh, to, to put it in, as, in an illustration, it's one of the things that I read was that uh, uh, talking about pride was that oftentimes there'll be preachers who will stand up and make a big deal of their humility. And, 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 the, and but what they preach, they never really preach anything with confidence because they're being so humble. They never come around to saying what the text means because they're being so humble. Yet the true preacher will stand up. And will proclaim the gospel faithfully and, every, and, and the truths of the gospel because his confidence is not in himself. His confidence is in what he's saying and the truth of the gospel and people will call him arrogant. In fact, it's reported that one of the accusations made against Charles Spurgeon was that he preached in such a manner that it sounded like he actually believed it. I love that. I love that. He preached in such a manner as, as if he actually believed what he preached. And, and so there's, you know, of course, nothing worse than someone who takes the truth and tries to put on an air of humility, but never comes down and says anything with certainty. We must all understand that to be able to deal with what Paul has been writing to us for the first short chapters, we need to understand Pride is at the root of this, and it really needs to be dealt with in the body of Christ. We still have these problems in evangelicalism today. So Paul, although he's still in the fourth chapter, is going to attack the Corinthians. He's going to hit them between the eyes. He's going to strike a blow against against those who have set themselves up as leaders. He's going to strike a blow against their seeming knowledge and their great wisdom, their wisdom that they borrowed from the world. And it's going to sound very harsh at times. There's a reason for that. It is. He's going to use sarcasm. He's going to use irony. That's the way he's going to deal with it. Now let's look at our text. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sake, that you may learn in us not to be not learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up behalf. Uh, let me see, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one another or one against the other. Okay, now he starts ref- by referring to these figures of speech that he has been using to address the Corinthians and who they are in Christ. When you look at the figures of speech, it becomes obvious how much as the body of a Christ, we are dependent upon the spirit for us to become who we are. Let me, let me just state that again. We are dependent upon the spirit for us to become who we are or for us to be who he has made us to be. Paul's first metaphor was that of agriculture. He said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. 
So neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. You are God's field. What do we do to become God's field? Nothing. The gospel came upon us, the spirit moved in us, and he made us that, and God caused the increase. Twice Paul says that. God gives the increase to stress the fact that it is God who brings these things about. God is the one who is making us into who we are. He also goes on and says, and I also say to you, I'm I'm sorry, let me back up a little bit. Christ said the same thing, that when it came to his church and it came to his kingdom, he's the one who's doing the work. It's not something we do. When Peter says, be holy for for he is holy. It's not something that we're going to make ourselves holy. We already are holy and we're to live in the light of, of who he's made us. But Christ said as much. He says, and I also say to you that you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, most of the time when we come to that text, everybody always focus on the gates of hell. That's not the focus. The focus is on what Christ is going to do. He is the one who will build the church. So it is fitting that Paul tells us twice, God, who, it's God who gives the increase. It, it's God who's made you the field. You are that field. The second metaphor that Paul uses was that of a building. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's build, building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me, a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds it. Now, what does this show us about who we are? And he'll also go on and say, you are the temple. Again, we didn't make ourselves a temple. He made us the temple. What does this show us? One, that we are passive in the reality of who God is making us to be. The people in Corinth were passive in that situation. They didn't raise themselves up and say, we are going to be the building or the temple or we're going to be the field of God. God was doing the work in them. And it's because the gospel, we are passive in the reception of the gospel and the grace and the mercy that we receive, there's no reason for us to boast in ourselves. Now, I love the picture of pedo communion. Uh, No, no, no. Pedo baptism. Because it's a perfect picture of the gospel. When we brought up Freya before us, and I remembered her name, so y'all please note almost forgot Freya and we baptized her she was completely passive she didn't do anything she didn't wake up one morning and say "Uh, dad can you get me baptized she didn't do anything she was completely passive the only thing she did and I don't even remember most kids they cry when they get wet but that's a picture of the gospel because we're completely passive in the situation. The parents had to bring us. Somebody else had to bring the gospel to us. The spirit moved in us and we were saved. So that's, that's, that's why it's so ridiculous to become arrogant as believers. Everything that we have, as we'll see, was given to us. A gift from God. We don't make ourselves into a field or into a building or into a temple. That's God's work. That's God's work. The point here is that we are passive in all of these things. And the reminder helps us understand Paul in the next verse. He goes on and he says, for who makes you differ from another? This is a lesson that I wish I could teach my kids in school. Who made you different from another? God did. God did. It's important that we know that. Who, he says, who, who makes you different from another? We didn't do it. And what do you have that you did not receive? Yes, but Timothy, I became rich because I worked hard and I used my intelligence. Your what? Your intelligence? Where did you get it? Oh, God gave me that. Everything else comes back to God. Okay, guess what? I've jumped ahead of myself. Let's go back to the other verse for a minute because I've still got more on that. He said, now these things, brethren, we're not fully there yet. I still want to develop that thought in a minute. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sake, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up upon, that none of you may be puffed up 
on behalf of one against the other. Now notice, this is another thing that I wanted to point out again. Notice the use of the word brethren. Again, why does he use that? He keeps using that over and over and over again as he's rebuking them, as he's correcting them, as he's challenging them to remind them who they are. They're brothers in, in Christ. They're still in Christ. And even though there's this, and we'll see in chapter 5, this heinous sin going on in the body of Christ, Paul hasn't cast them off. He hasn't said, well, I guess we got wrong there. Let's go start a new church. Those, those Corinthians are, are beyond redeemable. No. He, he's continuing on. He's long-suffering. He's patient with them. So it's a wonderful term to be reminded of. Brethren. And then he goes on and he says, I have figuratively transferred to myself an Apollos for your sakes. Now what's he saying here? When Paul speaks of transferring them to himself and Apollos, he did this and, and, and named himself as servants and pointed to him so that he did not have to point to the leadership that was leading people astray, thereby causing more division. He wasn't opening the door for more conflict to arise then. He's completely ignoring them. Now, there are places where Paul names the enemies of Christ and names those who are wrong in Scripture. I mean, he tells us about confronting Peter. So he's not afraid to do that, to confront Peter or to point out those who have gone wrong, who have left the faith. But he's doing that in order to focus on them. Why? He's trying to teach them. He says, that you may learn in us not to think what is beyond, not to think beyond what is written. That you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written. What's he saying there? People are, the commentators are all, you know, they spend a good page and a half or two on this, trying to figure out what's he referring to. Some of them say that he's referring to what was written before 1 Corinthians, which was a letter, and I found this out. This is awesome, y'all. This is cool. It, it, turn over to 5.9 in, in your Bibles. He, he actually wrote him a letter before 1 Corinthians. We don't have that letter, but he did write one. If you look at 5.9, it says, I wrote to you in my epistle, which means a letter, not to keep company with sexual immoral, immoral people. He'd already written that before this one. And then you see in verse, uh, go over to uh, chapter 7, verse 1. They responded to him. He says, now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is not good for a, a man not to touch a woman. Or it is good for a man not to touch a woman. So he's already had some letters go back and forth. We've lost that first letter. We don't have it. This is the first one we have. Some think that they believe that that's what he's referring to, what was written. Others believe that he's written, he's He's appealing to all of Scripture. What is written? What is written? And some believe that he is writing, he, he is referring to what he's writing to them right now and will write, continue in the letter. I, I'm one of those people that says it's every one of those situations. It's all of them. Because he's written, he's written the truth to them. And they have moved away from the truth in going to worldly wisdom. The moment you do that is you turn away from the truth of God. The truth of God, they, they moved away from it. And we know that they did that. Why? How do we know that they've gone beyond what was written? Because they became puffed up. They became prideful. They started saying, hey, look, I really like this Paul. Uh, he's my man. I'm going to start the Paul Coalition. And somebody's over there going, oh, I like Apollos. He, he, he's much more articulate and clear to understand. And, and uh, just, I just like him a whole lot better. And, and they started having these factions. And it's like, no, both those men are given to both of you. So don't start the faction. The problem is, is, is that we have is that when we let our pride rule in us, it lifts us up and it inflates us. And we become swelled up. And that's what was going on in Corinth. They had filled themselves with hot air. They had become, I like this word, bloviated. All right? 
bloviate is to stand and just talk a bunch of nonsense. It's to bloviate. It's, they became bloviated, which means they were, they were giving long-winded discourses in a boastful manner. They'd been given such blessings. Remember Uzziah and the blessing he received for seeking the Lord. What happened? All those blessings led to him having a prideful heart. This is, by the way, I think, I think it's Azur, I want to say, in Proverbs. It says, don't bless me with too much, but don't keep me poor either. He's, you know, in wisdom, he's like, just give me enough, Lord. Give me a place. Give me a home. Give me a job. You know, give me a beautiful wife. Give me, a, you know, children, all of those things. But not too much or I'll get prideful. Again, this is rampant among evangelicals and in the Christian church. They think that there are those who proclaim to themselves that the, the kingdom of God cannot advance without them. How quickly was Isaiah replaced when he died? Just like that. Just like that. All of this is driven by pride. Calvin points out that the problem was not just in the leadership. Listen to me here, okay? Listen to me here. It was also in the congregation. The congregation had become prideful as well. Um, For had they been satisfied with the good teachers that Paul left behind, they would not have been susceptible to the bloviators. They would not have given in to those who were Uh, trying to sound wise in their own eyes. They'd become prideful, arrogant. And let's remember what God says about that. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverse mouth I hate. That is the Lord. And then Galatians 6, 3 says, For if anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Okay? We are nothing. God works in us. We've been saved. We are his children. Those are the things that we rejoice in. Those are the things that we boast in because we're boasting in the gospel when we do that. Now his penetrating questions, which I alluded to earlier. He says, for who makes you differ from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? I mean, this is really one of those insightful verses about the sinfulness of pride. We are proud when we look at ourselves and our positions and our history, our family, our country, or a host of other gifts that we have been given and think that we are something because of those things. You know, we talk about being in the greatest country in the world or what was the greatest country in the world. And we're proud of that fact. Well, we're less proud today than we were before. But why? What do we do to make the United States the United States? What do we do to make ourselves here? This is why it's really silly to boast about where you're from. Where are you from? I'm from Texas. Really? How did you get there? I was born there. That's why I'm so proud. I'm Texan. I'm born in Texas. Really, what did you do to get your mother to be in that hospital in Texas so you could be there? How did you bring that about? No, if you're a Texan, it's a gift from God. A curse, according to some people. (laughs) It's a gift of God, all right? Where are you born? What about your family? You know, uh, why boast in your family? You were placed there by God. What do you have that you weren't given to by God? Again, like I said, the abilities, you know, the abilities. I hate to say this because whenever I start talking about pride, the one thing that my mind always goes to is the sporting world. And you know, the athlete, he gets the touch, he gets the ball and he runs all the way down and gets the touchdown and he's all dancing about me, 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 me. Never mind the fact that there were 10 other guys on the field that made it possible for him to get in the end zone. It's just filled with pride. Human pride and praise. I don't want to trample on anybody in case y'all like sports. I don't think you do, but just in case, you know, if you want to watch sports, go ahead. But you see the, the foolishness of it. Everything we have is given to us from the Lord. So Paul doesn't stop there. He doesn't stop with those penetrating questions. He keeps going. He says, you are already full. You are already rich. You have reigned with king, as kings without us. And indeed, I could wish you did reign. 
that we might reign with you. Now, that's an interesting thing to say because he's about to come back and say what's really going on in his life. And it's not good. He's showing them how puffed up they've become. They thought they were full and rich and reigning as kings already. Okay? Notice the progression. They're full. Okay? They're rich. They're kings. From being satisfied with food to, or actually being, yeah, satisfied with food to wealth to authority. What they thought they had done, brothers and sisters, in their immaturity and in their lack of wisdom, they thought that they had already arrived. They thought that they had already arrived, that they had attained the highest spiritual level to the point that they had left the apostles behind. They no longer needed the apostles because they were so spiritually Mature. Now there is always a real danger of this coming about in the life of the believer. Especially those who lack maturity. This is why you have movements, and I don't know if you've ever heard of this, uh, the Victorious Christian Living Movement. And, and there's a lot of appeal to it. There's some things that are good to it. it but it's, I haven't seen it in a number of years, so I think it's mostly died out. Partly because I've started hanging out in reform circles and we kind of see through it. But the movement's desire was good is that they seek, they sought to live moment by moment, completely by faith, surrendering to God and Christ in every moment. And all you have to do is surrender yourself to God. I think the first time I began to see the, the problem with that, I, I heard a fellow pastor say, yeah, but how much, is, how much surrendering is enough? How will you know, or no, how will you know if you've surrendered enough to please God? How do you know if you've surrendered at all? Now, the other thing about that movement is that many of them falsely believe that once you become a Christian, you can no longer sin and you should never be referred to as a sinner. This is where I was confronted with it in one of my earlier churches. It sounded reasonable, but it's not biblical. Okay, the, the woman that I was dealing with, she says, we're not sinners. You never see us called sinners in the, new, in the uh, epistles. Once we get past Acts, we're never called sinners again. And then I pointed out this small little verse in 1 Timothy. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And I pointed that out to her. I said, the Apostle Paul at the end of his life is writing this and he still calls himself a sinner. So are you or are you not a sinner? She eventually, because of that verse, came around. There were other things happening in her life too. But it took maturity. And that's the problem is that they were, the, the Corinthians were lacking maturity and they were puffing themselves up thinking that they no longer needed the guidance of the apostles and the, and, and the, you know, the prophets that were there and the, the teachers that were going to be raised up and the pastors. Paul writes in Philippians 3, not that I've already attained, so therefore he's writing against this idea of being able to attain on this side of glory, or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. This is why he's using sarcasm. They had become so puffed up in his estimation, he's just sending them these zingers in order to do that. Now let me caution you on the use of sarcasm and irony. The use of sarcasm and irony is in our toolbox for usage as believers, but we need to be careful with it. And we can only use it when the intended purpose is to convince someone of the truth. Paul wasn't sending these zingers to them just to send a zinger. He wasn't sitting there going, oh, check this out. I'm gonna twit this on the Twitter and, and gotcha. He wasn't doing that. His whole purpose was to see them repent of their sinfulness and their pride so that they would mature and go to growth. We also have to recognize that Paul was under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And if you continue to read on and you get to 2 Corinthians, you will find that the sarcasm and irony reached their intended goals. They were heartbroken when they read this letter. Paul continues. He says, For I think that, God, think that God has displayed us, the apostles, 
last as men condemned to death. For we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to the angels and to men. So what he's doing here is he's doing a comparison and contrast. He's trying to show them, look, y'all think y'all are all up here. You're exalted. You're sitting up here all full and working as kings. But look at us. We're condemned to death. And this is this idea. All of this is he says, I think that God has put us on display. And I think that we're being condemned to death is all language used for the person who has been uh, found guilty of something and they're brought forward to be made a spectacle of uh, and sport of and then they're taken off and let off and put to death. So Paul is using this very graphic language that they would understand. By the way, the word spectacle there in the Greek is the word we get theater from. But here it has the connotations of someone who is a spectacle. They are displayed on someone as a criminal or as a crook and they are to be made sport of. You remember the old scenes from movies where somebody was condemned to death and they'd throw apples at them and throw rotten tomatoes at them and stuff. That, that's what was taking place. And Paul's saying, this is what we are in comparison to you. Now, th- there is some truth to what's going on here because he's writing this as the riot is occur- occurring in Re- Ephesus in Ch- Acts chapter 19. And that's when we believe that he wrote it was during his time at Ephesus. And so... This is all taking place and he's having to hide and they are, all of these things are true. This is why he's using this. And instead of exalting himself, he's actually humbling himself. He's debasing himself saying, look, guys, I would rather be where I am than where you think you are. Listen to his next verse, this next verse. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are dishonored. According to the world, and according to the Corinthians who have so exalted themselves, Paul says that that he is a fool for Christ's sake because that's the way the world views us. The sarcasm is harsh because the danger of pride um, is immense. It'll take the Holy Spirit working through this sarcasm and these hard truths in order to change the hearts and minds of the Corinthians. And they have, by the way, they are believers. They have received the Holy Spirit. Uh, Back in chapter 2, verse 12, it says, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Yet in their pride, They decided to distance themselves from the Spirit and from what Paul said and go after worldly wisdom. Hopefully you can see the danger of becoming puffed up in the Christian life. There's no room for it. Yet it plagues all of us. So I'm going to just close by reading this and a few more thoughts. Just the rest of of what he writes. Because these are things that he was really experiencing in Ephesus as he was trying to flee the the riots and the crowds. To the present hour, we both hunger and thirst. They were full, remember? And we are poorly clothed. They thought they were rich. And beaten and homeless, they thought they were kings. And we labor working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we endure, being defamed, we entreat. We have been made as the filth of the world, the offscoring of all things until now. This is a picture of what the world thinks of us. We are the filth of the world, according to them. Pride is your greatest enemy. Humility is your greatest friend. John Stott wrote that. And I think that we can see the problem of it. Hopefully we've seen the problem of it by going through this with a view on pride because they were puffing themselves up. The Corinthians needed to repent. And it might have crushed them. We might have thought that Paul's sarcasm was just mean-spiritedness. But look one more verse, verse 14, what he says. 
I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. I warn you as my beloved children. He's a father writing to his children, saying, straighten up. Be holy. Pursue holiness. You know, that's pretty much the outline of the whole book. Pursue holiness. And when we see pride rising up in us, we need to repent of it too. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness and kindness in these harsh words. We pray that we would hear them and realize the danger of pride in our own lives. And let us repent of it. Let humility be our greatest friend. Let the truth of the gospel be our greatest friend. Let the reminder of all that we have as Paul pointed out, is given to us. Every blessing is given to us. Let us not see those blessings as something to boast in, but rejoice that we have a gracious and loving Father who wants to give us good things and does give us good things. It's in your Son's name we pray. come down to the table, and as I've said before, that all those who have been baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are welcome to join us in the partaking of the Lord's Supper. That's called fencing the table. And there's much dispute about how much you should fence and how little you should fence, should fence the table, which means showing people that they should not be there. If you're not a Christian and you're not trusting in Christ and you've never been baptized, no. You shouldn't, take, you shouldn't partake of them. But otherwise, the table is pretty open. I believe in more of an openness to it because it shows God's grace. It shows God's kindness. It's a gift from God to His people. And I point that out because I, in the account of the Lord's Supper that I want to use with you tonight is that which we find in Luke chapter 22. He says, when the hour had come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. The 12 apostles. So who's there with him? Judas Iscariot. He didn't draw up and start drawing up a fence and say, have you examined your heart? Have you done all these things? Have you memorized the shorter catechism? Have you done all of that? Otherwise, you can't come to the table. No, our Lord shared communion. With Judas Iscariot. It says after he goes. It says this cup is the new covenant of my blood. Which is shed for you. Listen to what Jesus says next. But behold the hand of my betrayer. Is with me on the table. He wasn't ignorant. Of what Judas was doing. Yet he still welcomed him to the table. How much more so. Should we welcome those. Who have been baptized to the table. And are in the covenant keeping community. And rejoice at the gift we've been given. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you that I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For as I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and gave, and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we thank you for these elements in this sacrament, Lord, that it reminds us of your grace, your mercy, your kindness to us in the gospel, and that you have invited us to the table. We pray that as we partake of this ele these elements by faith, that you use them and we grow spiritually. And that we grow in our knowledge of the richness of your grace and mercy. And we rejoice 
in the gospel that Christ gave his life. He gave his body and shed his blood on our behalf. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Jesus, the night of the day he was betrayed, he took the bread, he broke it, he said, this is my body, do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, she took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Let us do this in remembrance of him. Mm -hmm. 
If you would, take your Psalter and open them to Psalm 150a. 150a. 